The following is a live broadcast of a Lone Star Community Radio program. Recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Connors FM 104.5, 106.1, and Facebook.com slash IRLoneStar. For more information on this show, please visit our show page at IRLoneStar.com slash shows. To sponsor or donate to this program, visit our donate page at IRLoneStar.com slash donate, or email us at lscrstudios at gmail.com, or give us a call at 936-666-1084. Lone Star Community Radio production and broadcast is possible by folks like you. So sponsor and donate today. You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Extension Hour. I'm Amy Ressler, County Extension Agent for Family and Community Health. And today I've got Bill and Brandon with us, and we're going to do this. So I've got a great name for this this show. <laughs> you ready? Ready? So it's the buzz about bees and bugs with Bill and Brandon. And it's going to be really good because we're going to talk about lots of cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, this is the Extension Hour. We're here on uh, Fridays, 1 to 2 p.m. And then also sometimes we pre-record, but even when we do it live, we record. And then people can go back and watch on Facebook or on the um, yeah, on, you know, Facebook Live and then on Facebook and on YouTube and then on the uh, radio station's website. Also, you can go back and see previous shows as well. So um so we're going to talk about bees and bugs today. I don't remember what date it was, but at one point we had a couple of beekeepers, a mother and daughter um, team that were with us, and they talked a little bit about the Beekeepers Association. So we're just going to today talk kind of general about all kinds of things, um, which is kind of what we do on the Extension Hour anyway. We talk about our people, our programs, and our partnerships. And Bill is actually one of our people. We consider you one of one of our people because you're one of our master gardeners. Mm-hmm. But um, <clears throat> let me do a formal introduction because I have a, I have a business card. <laughs> <laughs> that Bill gave me. So this is Mr. William G., a.k.a. Bill Boytem Sr., USAF, which is the United States Air Force, retired. He's got a BS in ag entomology and applied ecology and an MBA. Um, and I won't give out your address or your phone number, but um, <laughs> he is a beekeeper, a brewer, a bonsai, or bonsai, Cabinet maker, imagery, interpreter, master gardener, that's how we know him, mead maker, photography, safety, tinkerer, system manager, tool, tool care, and sharpening, and winemaker. He's jack of all trades and master of none. Kind of sounds like a county extension agent, huh, Brandon? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, we're really glad you could be with us here today. So I, so I gave you this, this very um, extensive yeah. introduction. Do you, would you like to introduce yourself and say anything about you? Bill. <laughs> well, my first experience with bees was back in about 1964 when our uh, physics uh, instructor installed an observation hive in the greenhouse at the uh, biology area. And that was my first exposure. Then getting a degree in entomology, and my senior uh, project was uh, bee communication. For a seminar and then I went on with graduate school at two different places in mm-hmm. entomology before I finally got an MBA but uh, I started raising bees probably in 76 uh, I've done it in a couple places in Texas Arizona Virginia Pennsylvania and then back here again so oh, wow but there's been some big uh, holidays there so it hasn't been a continuous time <laughs> but uh, and where did you go to school at uh, University of Delaware oh, okay and then you get all the way down here to Texas? Well, I spent 20 right years now. bouncing around the U.S. and foreign countries in the Air Force, so. It's a good place to settle, right? Yep, <laughs> yep. And it's sort of funny, when I was in Panama, any of the swarms that came in in the 80 time frame were all treated as Africanized swarms. And they would get out there essentially with uh, firefighter foam and just foam the whole swarm that came in, and that was it. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, on a sad note, one of my son's uh, instructors actually got caught out in Lake Gatun with a swarm and got stung to death. So, oh. so they were pretty well vicious there. But 
with all their bad press, people actually raise honey with them in the Central America and Africa. So they are a honey source and used in agriculture. Mm -hmm. They just need to be treated a little differently than other bees. Right. Very important to our ecosystem as well. So you've brought up a couple of good points. One, and that, that you've raised bees and been a beekeeper in several different states. Two, you bring up the Africanized honeybee. And so um, that's one thing that I have been asked periodically in the office about. But first off, I mean, as far as being a beekeeper in different states, how does that differ from Texas? Well, actually, even within Texas, it differs quite a bit. In our area, we can get a good honey crop. We can raise bees year-round. If you go down in the valley, you can raise packaged bees, but you get very little honey because mm -hmm. of the crop makeup. Uh, in the panhandle, you'd have very cold winters, so you'd have a different wintering strategy than we do here where it's much milder. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to Arizona, it was hot and dry, so we had to provide uh, water for the bees. But there in Tucson, we had three primary honey crops. There was uh, mesquite, cat's claw, and swirl cactus. And you got a water white honey that when you extracted it and you chilled it a couple of degrees, it would and it actually crystallized. It was so dry of absence of moisture. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a lot of bee extractions out there. There was four of us that worked together. We'd go into buildings and remove the hives out of uh, old buildings, churches, stuff like that when they were renovating uh, some of the guest houses out there. That's kind of what, what I was thinking about was the difference in climate. You know, down here, I know with our own bees, I mean, you'll have very few days where it's freezing weather or it's, you know, even in the 40s So in, in our winter time. And so in terms of the bees, you don't really worry about them that much. But up north, I mean, you've got, you've got blizzards that you've mm -hmm. got to account for and really cold temperatures. So. Well, one of your worst things is if you have snow, you can have blowing snow and can physically block the lower entrance to the beehive. So, in, you know, like in Iowa and a lot of the northern states with a lot of snow, they will actually open up a top entryway. The other thing is the bees digest honey during the year and they essentially eat it and then they sort of vibrate or shiver. That generates heat. It also generates CO2 and water vapor. And that's how they keep the cluster warm and survive the winter. Yeah. Well, that moisture will get up and it needs to get out of the hive because when you have protracted cold weather and a lot of humidity, you get a uh, fungal disease known as nosema, which is essentially dysentery. And unless they can get out of the hive and do what's known as a cleansing flight, then they defecate in the hive and it just perpetuates this. So you have a, a, uh, oh, a disease problem in the spring, whereas here, you know, it warms up to 55, 60 degrees. You have bees out flying doing their cleansing flights and you don't have that problem. So each area has some specific uh, problems and some benefits to it depending on the area uh, one thing for anybody that's a new beekeeper or wanting to get into beekeeping is there's tons of stuff on youtube uh, there's tons of stuff available you know google it but look at where the source is if you're reading about upper michigan and trying to apply it here in conroe it's not necessarily going to work right so again, and the other thing is you can ask a beekeeper a question, and depending on the time of year, you'll get a different answer. Because this time of year I would do this, you ask me the question, what should I be doing now? Two months later I'll say, no, this is what you should be doing. Well, you told me to do this later. Well, mm -hmm. again, it's seasonal and you march through the season. Uh, for people that are interested in some guides there, the East Texas Beekeepers Association has sort of a yearly guide available on the internet which will sort of step you through things that uh, you should do during the year locally uh, i think it's blue bonnet beekeeping had a uh, guide that they put on and if you go to the moco bees website a lot of those are posted there you can just download them and uh, it gives you sort of a guide of some of the things you should be do but then again you've got to make it seasonal and apply it to what have been the conditions right 
In other words, if you have, we just came through a, what is known as a nectar flow where the flowers are blooming. We had a fairly dry one, but if we had rain during that whole period, we'd gotten very little nectar in, which would produce very little honey. Mm. So again, you've got to constantly monitor what's going on. Right. Yeah, and there's, you know, what I've noticed is different parts of the county are different too. Like there are people who are getting bukus of honey off their hives and ours are they're, they're good but they're not what other people are getting and mm -hmm. so the the food source for those bees isn't necessarily the same in the same county so mm -hmm. we have to manage our bees a little different than what some other people are we're actually supplementing ours a little bit at, yes. at this time right. so and so when brandon says his he literally means his very own he's a, he's also a beekeeper so yeah very I'm novice <laughs> beekeeper you've got the expert in mr bill but I'm very novice. Me and my family, we've been doing it about four years. We've got six hives that we manage. And um, you mentioned something a while ago that's a really good point for somebody who's wanting to get into bees, because this was the most frustrating thing for me, is I'm very textbook. Like, this is this, this is this, this is this. But you may ask this beekeeper one thing and another beekeeper tell you something different. So you kind of have to learn your own bees and watch them and come up with your own management. Well, one of the things that the BOCO bees do as an organization, right now they're going all virtual, but they had a mentor mentee program where a new beekeeper could sign up and have somebody mentor them, which is their go-to person that can sort of walk them through things. They and actually answer call their them questions. newbies, right? Mm -hmm. The newbies? Yeah, <laughs> and then BOCO bees also has a youth program, which is very good. Uh, it's home for, I think, 12 to 17-year-olds who have to be that age on 1 September. And they provide a scholarship with a beehive and the equipment. And it's an 18-month program where the youth get to learn beekeeping. And they have a mentor. And, again, they have to give reports back to the organization about what they're doing and what's happening. But, again, that's a way for the youth to get involved with it, which would probably be a good thing with 4-H or something like that, too. And 4-H has a beekeeper essay contest that mm -hmm. they do every year so that young beekeepers can um, showcase their knowledge and skills mm -hmm. with the, that contest. And win a scholarship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so. so you um, started, so you said about four years. So, Bill, I was in his office the other day, and I kept hearing this weird little noise. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's my queen. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> he was getting a new queen. We had yep. to requeen one. Yep. So she uh, she spent a little time with me in the office for a while. So <laughs> I didn't want to leave her in the hot truck. So. No, no, I'll cook. Yeah. Which is one of those interesting things about beekeeping, right? Because they um, there's, there's um, lots of behavioral things that you have to pay attention to, right? So we are going to pay attention to that, um, but we're going to take a little bit of a break. And then we'll be back in just a little bit more and we'll talk some more and give leave some tips for people who might be interested in bee, beekeeping. And then just we'll talk a little bit about why bees are important. And if we get into it, let's let's talk a little bit about bugs, too, because having a B.A. in entomology and applied ecology, definitely, you know, a lot about bugs. And that's what they told me at the office, too. Like Bill is the bug, bug guy. <laughs> so we'll be right back after this break. You're listening to Lone Star Radio 104.5, 106.1. This is the Extension Hour where we highlight our people, our programs and our partnerships. Does your company have needs that can be met by an employee who is dependable, hardworking, enthusiastic, motivated, cooperative, respectful, and punctual? Conroe Independent School District at Special Education Department can meet your needs by connecting you with potential employees that have been preparing for a lifetime of employment. We have numerous individuals seeking paid and unpaid work experiences. If your company is interested in seeing how we can meet your business needs, call Conroe ISD Special Education Department to find the best employees for you at 936-709-7671. Lone Star Boxer Rescue is a nonprofit organization serving Montgomery County and surrounding areas, dedicated to the health and well-being of the boxer breed. Lone Star Boxer Rescue is run and managed 100% by volunteers since 1999. Our main objective is to rescue, rehabilitate, and rehome boxers that come to us from many sources, including local animal shelters, owner surrenders, and strays. For more information about Lone Star Boxer Rescue, visit our website at lsbr.org.
don't forget to download the Lone Star Community Radio app from your Google Play or Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's Community Radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM. That's Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. If you are on the computer, bookmark IRLoneStar.com as your internet radio station. A Lone Star Community Radio, broadcasting 24-7 from the heart of downtown Conroe, Texas. Extension Hour. I'm Amy Ressler, County Extension Agent for Family and Community Health, and we're buzzing about bees with Bill and Brandon. Ooh, and I said that really, really good. Yeah, because sometimes I trip over my tongue, so <laughs> and then I'm probably going to, like, jinx myself now. Um, so this is the Extension Hour. We talk about our people, our programs, our partnerships. So we're talking with our, one of our peoples today, Bill and Brandon is our um, ag agent. And we didn't really introduce you just a whole lot, but you know, this is Brandon. He's the ag agent here in Montgomery County. I've um, been here for a while now, so you're, you're, we're not even going to say you're new anymore because a really. couple of years, right? A couple we're of years. two years now. Yeah. So yeah, old hat. Yep. Um, so we had mentioned before we went to break about the beekeeping essay that the 4-H program does. Um, so just usually on the extension hour, we talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening in extension. And um, of course, you know, we're in a really weird time right now with um, the pandemic that's happening and some of the... Um, restrictions that we have to follow to keep everybody safe. So things, things have been just like a little bit different, but one of the things that's been like not different with our 4-H members is um, doing 4-H record books, which is um, an opportunity that they have. It teaches them some really important life skills, but they keep records about all of their projects that they do, and then they, they write them down and put them in a certain format in what we call a 4-H record book, and then they submit that record book to be judged um, against others. So there's an, a category. So they're, they're ranked among other record books that are in the same category, but they're also judged individually as well because um, you, a first year 4-H member is not going to have the same experience as a more um, mature 4-H member. So um, also just kind of um, letting them showcase the things that they've learned. So it's a really awesome project and our coworker, Michelle Mahalik, she's like the record book queen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, knows, Definitely. she knows everything about record books. So um, anyway, so we just recently were judging um, went through the judging process for our district record book um, contest, and then uh, some of those will actually go on to state too. So that's um, one of those things that are that are happening. Um, but in, and lots of lots of other things too. We'll talk about a little bit later. But let's buzz a little bit more about bees. So um, one of the calls that you get a lot in the office about bees is is how can I make this into an ag exemption? Mm -hmm. So an agricultural tax exemption. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about that. There are um, ag values that one can have on their property, um, given you have the right parameters, the right um, uh, number of acres and whatnot to qualify for each. I mean, there's ones for timber, one f ones for hay, ones for cattle, horses, uh, several others, but then also one that came into play, I don't know how many years it's been, but it's relatively Three, four, new, five. yeah, is beekeeping. Um, and so you can have, have ag value on your property if you're a beekeeper within certain parameters again. I mean, you have to have at least five acres. Six. Is it six now? And um, six hives on this on this um this this property and it's up to 20 acres is what i was reading and i think you can have up to you have to have up to 11 hives on that that 20 acre property um and they have to be active beehives um you have to show um proof of management of those bees because what a lot of people don't realize that call our office um want to do this is i want to buy some bees and throw them out there and count this as an ag exemption well they don't realize bees need management they need to be you need to oversee them um, yes I do know people that have hives out there that they don't ever mess with um, but um, if you are really receiving ag value off of those bees then you're actually going to be in them managing the hives monitoring those bees their health their production you're probably going to be taking some production off of them which means honey or if you're into raising bees, then you might be raising queens or uh, package bees or um, wax, um, different things, making candles, things like that. Proof of production and ag value. So um, beekeeping is an option. It just requires some major discussion before you get into it. Mm -hmm. There's an upfront cost. Um, 
uh, a nucleus hive can cost you anywhere from $150 to $250, $300, depending on who you're buying it from. And that nucleus hive is going to be the starter to go into your, your colony, mm -hmm. uh, to build your colony of bees. Um, so anyway, there's, there's, there's that cost of the, there's the cost of the equipment, um, a lot of different things that go into it. There is the option now um, of people bringing bees out to your property um, and you counting that as an ag exemption, but that's not exactly as easy as what some people want to make it out to be. There's still management that goes along. There's really a partnership that goes with you and that beekeeper that has to be maintained an agreement um, and Bill probably has a lot more to offer that with all of his experience so and you told me the other day too sometimes the bees don't like where they're at and they fly sometimes they away leave and they go somewhere that's the else. difference between <laughs> livestock and bees you can't fence bees in they go where they want to go you know? and you, you were saying in the break a little bit about um, you kind of treat your bees the way you treat your cattle mm -hmm. or you think of them that same way um, everything's not just black and white with them I mean just like with my cows I know if she's not acting right if she's lethargic her ears are down she's telling me there's something wrong so I go figure out what it is she might need to be dewormed she might just be too hot um, there's some form of illness there or if they lose condition their body weight's not what it's supposed to be then something's wrong they're not getting the nutrition that they need and those bees I've learned will tell me the same thing if there's not that much activity coming in and out of that hive I know I need to get in there and see what's going on uh, there the queen may not be existing anymore she may not be producing there may be something else there may be other health issues in that hive that we need to address mm -hmm. and there are ways to address that but um, I've learned um, instead of just taking every and you learn from everybody so I take bits and pieces and learn from all of that but um, a lot of times um, it's really smart to pay attention to what your bees are doing because they're going to sure. tell you right. so and we, we talked a little bit about using bees and beekeeping as an ag exemption but sometimes people just want to keep bees in their backyard just to have bees and to mm -hmm. have a source of honey um, that kind of things because i'm thinking of another call that we get sometimes in the office is my neighbor has bees and i don't want my neighbor to have bees right. because it's really close to where i'm at and i'm afraid of bees um so that's another kind of um concern or issue that comes up but let's talk a little bit about why would someone have bees either as a ag exemption or in a backyard what would be some of the the reasons to have well, obviously to bees? the ag exemption is for a, a tax break on your property taxes so um th that's the ultimate reason why someone's doing that but they may you know there's a lot of people that have an initial interest in beekeeping and they use that for that but then there are those that that that's their only reason for doing it, is to get a break mm -hmm. on my property taxes but i want the honey yeah. That's what I like is honey. Not that I, I don't keep bees, <laughs> but if I were going to keep bees. And you brought up a good point. Honey. If you're yeah. going to be a beekeeper, you really need to take a lot of things into consideration. Everybody around you, I mean, like ours are strategically placed at the very, very back of our property away from anything and everything so that they're not hopefully intruding on other people. Again, you can't fence bees in, but I don't have them right next to our neighbors either or where we would be operating a tractor or are having to do a lot of things that would disturb them yeah. so well the thing with bees is you always hear the bee line which is a direct line so if you have a hive on your property you can put up some fencing or a hedge that makes the bees fly at least above head height and they become invisible to the neighbors at that point uh, the other thing is brandon mentioned about equipment around it some bees especially the africanized bees are very sensitive to vibrations so if you're mowing weed wagon with a gas mower right next to them, sometimes they'll come out and say, hey, stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the bees. Only they Leave don't talk alone. very well. They usually <laughs> give you a point uh, injection of venom and say, okay, did you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's one thing you can do. The other thing is talk to your neighbors. Uh, I've had neighbors that have... Uh, outright poison the bees i've had other neighbors that say oh great we've got bees i've and the end of the year i've had them come up and say that's the best garden i've ever had i've had all this fruit and vegetables from your bees so again a lot of it is education of people uh if you want bees see what your homeowners association says mm. 
The other thing you can do is if you want bees, maybe you can find somebody's house that you can put them at that is out in the country mm -hmm. and out of the way that you can go visit and take care of them. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, one thing a lot of people will do is with butterfly and, and bee or pollinator gardens, uh, with butterflies, maybe we have a little bit more influence, but with bees, bees generally need a half acre or more to forage on for nectar. If you've got one or two nectar plants there, the bees may find them, but they're gonna to talk to each other and go to where the main nectar sources are. And bees do things like Brandon was saying, they talk to you, but bees talk to themselves. There's a man by the name of Carl von Frisch who did his uh, research in the Austria Alps or mountains in Austria in the 1940s on bee communication. And he came up with the uh, bee dance. In other words, bees will communicate three things, the distance, the location, and the source of the honey in their dance. So depending on the distance, there'll be a round dance, there'll be a figure eight dance, there'll be a straight line dance. And by their, their maneuvers there, how frequently they repeat it, they'll tell you the distance. The direction is indicated by the sun with gravity being vertically up is flying towards the sun. And then they will dance at an angle to the sun. So when you leave the hive, you orient the sun and, and go to that angle off of it to find the source. And then bees are also good at communicating the quality. In other words, they will regurgitate the nectar, which has both the scent of the flower and the quality of the sugar content of it. So by doing that, they might have four or five different bees dancing from various locations. The one that's the most aggressive in giving their message, okay, the bees are gonna go there because that's the better source. Bees will also forage one source in the morning, another source in the evening, because they will depend on the sugar content of the nectar. And nectar will vary something like from 5% sugar to about 60 some percent sugar. So, and then they've got to uh, react with that sugar with enzymes to create the honey, because nectars are basically fructose, glucose, and sucrose. Sucrose is broken down by one of their uh, enzymes into fructose and glucose. And that's primarily what you'll find the sugars in honey. So anyway, they will do that and then they will evaporate it down till it hits about 82, 83% solids. And that will make a product that is stable. When honey gets up to around 19% moisture, then it can ferment on you. So again, bees, but at 19% moisture, there's a glu uh, glucose oxidase enzyme becomes active again. It breaks down glucose into gluconic acid and, and uh, hydrogen peroxide, which becomes a preservative for the honey until they rehydrate or uh, dehydrate the honey. So again, the bees, if you look at their life cycle and all the things going on there, it's a miracle what happens. And you mentioned yes. preservative. I mean... There are stories that they found honey in old tombs that's still edible. Well, part of that has to do with the uh, environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, where it's dry, 10-15% moisture, that honey will stay forever because honey will give up moisture, absorb moisture based on the relative humidity. Mm -hmm. So your normal honey coming out of a hive uh, which is called grade A and has a certain moisture content, it's stable at 60% relative humidity. It will neither gain moisture nor lose moisture. If you put it at 40%, it's going to lose moisture and it'll become drier. So if you get honey and you harvest it and the water content's too high, you can physically dry it out with a dehumidifier and bring it down to where it's within the grading. Uh, in Arizona, we'd get honey that was probably about 14% moisture. And like I say, as soon as it chilled, it would crystallize. So mm -hmm. again, these are some of the, the factors with honey. And the problem uh, with honey is once it granulates, that causes the moisture content to increase. It's a little funny chemical balance going on there. So if you have 
honey that's liquid and it's all great and good. If it crystallizes, it becomes a higher moisture content and then it can ferment. So mm -hmm. again, that's a little bit probably more math and science that people want to hear right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you probably get into mead, right? Because you're a mead maker? Yes. Okay, so <laughs> got lots of, lots of questions about honey and mead and, and other kinds of things. Because, Bill, you were just like so full of knowledge. You could probably... Very, very yeah, smart. I know, yeah. right? Okay, so we're going to make a beeline for a break. Do you like how I put yeah, that in there? Good, All right, good so we're, thank you, thank you. <laughs> we're going to take a little bit of a break. We're going to come back, and we're going to learn more from the awesome Bill Boynton and the awesome Brandon Gregson. This is the Extension Hour. We're talking about people, programs, and partnerships on Lone Star Radio, and we'll be right back after this. Listen in Mondays at noon to hear Conroe news from local nonprofits, businesses, upcoming events, Conroe Park events, news stories, and information that matters to you with your host, Margie Taylor of Taylorized PR. For more information about being a guest, visit IRLoneStar.com slash Conroe Culture. What can the Better Living for Texans program do for you? You can learn how to increase your consumption of fruits and vegetables, choose foods that are relatively inexpensive and good to eat, make your food dollars last longer, prepare quick, nutritious meals, help your children learn how to eat healthier snacks, and much more. Our program is committed to helping people like you improve your health through providing research-based nutrition education in a friendly, cost-free, and relaxed environment. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, helping Texans make their lives better. We have the safest food supply in the world. Strict laws and regulations restrict the usage of hormones, antibiotics, and pesticides within our food supply. Production agriculture practices and technologies such as the use of GMOs, which is not any more or less risky than conventional crop production, has allowed American farmers to produce more food on less acres in environmentally sound ways. Find out more online at pathtoplate.tamu.edu. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Helping Texans make lives better. Welcome back. We're buzzing about bees with Bill and Brandon. I'm Amy Ressler. This is the Extension Hour People Programs Partnership. So there are a lot of programs that are related to beekeeping. So we have a beekeepers association, and you mentioned that just a little bit, Bill, when you were first talking about the MoCo bees, which is basically the beekeeper association here in Montgomery County. Um, but we like to use abbreviations and acronyms a lot. So, um, but there is a beekeepers association. So if you're interested in that, like you said, right now they're kind of doing some things virtually, but they do meet um, meet once a month, right? At our office. You traditionally, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we'll get back. We'll get back to that point at at some point. But um, if you want to know more about those, definitely give us a call. Talk to Brandon. He can hook you up. Um, so before we uh, went to the break, we were talking about honey. Um, so like, do all bees make honey? Like every beehive is it going to make honey, or is it like do you have to do something to make sure that you get? I mean, if if like your if your goal was to have a beehive to harvest honey. Do you have to do something differently? Basically, you need them located in an area where you will have adequate nectar-bearing flowers because you will have <clears throat> so much nectar gathered, they'll ripen it, and they will use some of it to raise baby bees. In other words, the, uh, really go quick through uh, bee life, uh, life uh, cycle. The egg is laid, hatches after three days. Basically all life cycle, while well, the drone, which is the male bee and the worker bee, are fed a uh, glandular secretion known as royal jelly, which is also a bee product that people buy in health food stores. Right. It's a gelatinous, white, white milky stuff. The bees will feed that for three days, and then they get what's known as bee bread, which is honey and nectar and pollen. Pollen is a protein source. So those are things that are needed. And the bees, depending on the race of bees, some bees are gung-ho and they just keep producing young bees. So they get tons of young bees. Others will regulate based on what's available to eat. So they will gear up in the spring, have the honey flow or nectar flow. It'll reduce 
they will cut down on the amount of brood that they produce, which is the baby bees collectively. So again, you have some of that monitoring. But if you have a surplus, uh, you'll put extra boxes. And in beekeeping, there's some specific terms which are unfortunately glommed on and generalized. So a hive is generally known as two deep boxes or two brood boxes, which in those boxes are about nine and a half inches tall, have 10 frames traditionally, except top bar is another one that we're not talking about. We're talking basically Langstroth hives. And then, so you'll have two of those you're raising bees in, and they will store pollen and honey in there and have their brood rearing. And then above that, when you have a nectar flow, you'll put a medium, or it's also known as a honey super, it's about six and a half inches. And you'll put that on and they'll fill that up with honey and that's what you harvest. And in some cases where you have a lot of a honey flow, you may have two or three honey supers on there. And part of it has to do with uh, your physical abilities. Because if you have a deep box with 10 frames of honey in it, that weighs about 90 pounds. If you have a honey super or a medium full, that's in the 50 pounds. <laughs> So again, depending on how much weight you want to hoss around, uh, you tailor some of your equipment to, to your own physical capabilities. Mm -hmm. But anyway, on a honey super, you can probably get about uh, two and a half pounds per frame to three pounds per frame. So you get 30 or so pounds of honey out of there. And how often does it replenish? It again, depends on your season. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you usually here, we'll have a spring flow and then a fall flow. In the summer, Brandon said you may need to do some supplemental feeding. Again, if I can sell honey at a couple dollars a pound, I'll take as much honey off as I can and I can feed them sugar at 40 cents a pound mm -hmm. and keep them going so it's economic, which what am I gonna get my money from? So again, I can supplemental feed sugar syrup during the summer when it's a dearth and keep them alive at a stable and then stop feeding when the next uh, flow comes and then for winter time around here you need probably around 40 pounds of stored honey in the hive to get them over winter again for their food for their for own their nutrition food. okay yeah. so, so you can't take it from them no, no. They'll and, and again death. we we have a you know like last last winter i had asters blooming all winter and then we have the uh yopon holly that comes out and a lot of other early blooming flowers some of them are totally insignificant you can't see them but they do produce nectar so the bees can forage on that and they can maintain so again you're you're looking at your hive seeing what it's telling you one thing they do is talk about doing hive inspections another quick one is you go back and lift the back end of the hive up if it's real light okay i need to feed syrup if it's heavy okay they're good on stores i don't even have to open them up i can get that I can look at the general activity, how many bees are flying in and out of the front, and that sort of tells me it. Uh, the other problem I have is if I start feeding in the spring, I can get a situation known as honey bound. In other words, I've fed them so much syrup, they have absolutely no cells open to lay eggs in, mm -hmm. which will then cause them to say, hey, we're crowded, it's time to swarm, divide the hive and leave. So again, you've got to monitor that. Do I have enough? Am I feeding too much? So again, you got to sort of look in there and, you know, see what the bees are telling you. So how do you know when to pull the super out to get the honey, uh, to go ahead and harvest the honey? Well, you, you look at uh, seeing if the cells are capped. In other words, is there a wax covering on mm -hmm. the cells? And generally, if the frame has about 70% or more of it cap, then you can extract it. Okay. Again, you'll do a moisture content using a refractometer, which will tell you the moisture. So you're looking at like about 16.5% moisture is what you want. So again, if it's too uh, wet, I can dry it out. Mm -hmm. Or I can just sample a couple cells. It only takes a drop to sample it. But then I take and I slice the cappings off, put it in a machine, I crank or has an electric motor on it, and centrifugal force, it throws the honey out and it drains down, it's filtered, and then bottled. Uh, there's some terms out there that float, and people want, I want organic honey. 
Well, organic honey is pretty much a figment of your imagination because if you look at a bee's range is like three miles or better for nectar gathering. So you would need a radius of six miles around that hive that absolutely uses nothing that's contrary to organic gardening principles. And you can't monitor every bee. Yeah. <laughs> you can't tell them you can't eat that. Yeah. Where, where, where were you exactly when you collected that? Yeah. Take roll. <laughs> Whereas if you're up in the Dakotas and stuff with these massive alfalfa and massive uh, clover fields, you may be able to actually have an organic honey up there. Mm -hmm. The other term that's bannered about is raw honey mm -hmm. versus pasteurized and stuff. Raw honey basically is extracted, uh, put through a screen to get the big chunks of wax out, led to gravity feed, which gets the little pieces of wax out, and then it's bottled. It will have pollen in it. And in fact, there's two states, I think it's Florida and California, if honey does not have pollen in it, it has to be sold as sugar syrup because to be honey, it has to have pollen in it. And a lot of the large places will ultra filter the honey because then it has a longer shelf life before it crystallizes. Mm -hmm. So again, you have those things. Most people like the raw honey and there's touted to be uh, health benefits by eating the pollen. But then again, is it spring honey or fall honey? Two different classes of plants. So mm -hmm. if I've got fall allergies, eating spring honey is not gonna do me any good. All right. And another one of those terms that come up a lot is local, the local food sources. And that's an interesting, because there's not really an FDA um, rule or a, a, an accepted definition of what local is, because it's kind of like what's local to you. So um, do you want to talk about that, Any? I, I would look at it being within the same county for local. Okay. You, you know, I would think that would be good. Uh, probably you could stretch it and say it's Texas honey. Mm -hmm. You know, or it's Southeast U.S. honey. Uh, you, you know, it's it's one of those things. I, I think you're really definitive. Is it a heated pasteurized honey or is it a raw honey? Are probably the two more important things. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing that's neat when you, you extract honey or even when you work your hive, sometimes there's little bits of uh, honeycomb that they build there and they'll fill with honey well it's not where it's supposed to be so you clean it off well that'll have honey so you pop it in and chew it and it's mm -hmm. uh it's a real treat but other yeah. people think you got to do that yeah yeah when you said earlier too a lot of people tell you oh honey it's be barf <laughs> yeah right? yeah and that's not necessarily true yeah. i mean there's some biology behind that yeah. too well they're the as the bee ages different uh systems come into being and one of the systems that come in to the bees that are in the hive before they become field bees is working the honey, pulling it back and out, evaporating it down, putting in the invertase uh, enzyme, which breaks the sucrose down, plus it uh, ripens the honey or gets rid of the moisture. So as the bee gets older, that enzyme system no longer functions. So the field bee is not really breaking down the sucrose in the nectar. So that comes back, it may do a little bit, but again, it's relying on the bees in the hive to break that down. Oh. And then you, so honey, the, the term honeymoon yep. comes from mead made from honey. Am I remembering yes. that right? You, yes. That, and and that, you make mead that sometimes was too? Traditionally, it was to feed the bride and groom a copious amount of honey or mead, which is fermented honey, in the hopes of having a offspring during their honeymoon. Okay. And honey, if you go back to the, or mead, if you go back to the old days, probably in English class, you studied Beowulf and they talked about the great mead halls. Mm -hmm. Well, originally uh, bees were grown in things known as skep, where they were pulled out of tree trunks and stuff like that. We didn't have the extractors. We didn't have all the modern conveniences for beekeeping. And they would sort of crush the hive and the s liquid would flow out and they'd have that as honey. And then the rest of the hive, they would boil in water and then it would ferment. And that was their, their alcoholic beverage. And mead, uh, traditional mead is honey, water, and yeast. Now, if you put a fruit in there, Depending on the fruit, it gets another name. But generally, fruit and honey, when they're fermented together, is known as a mellow mel. 
So you go down to your local liquor store and you look in the mead section, they'll say raspberry mead. Nah, it's a raspberry mellow mel. But again, it's, people don't understand the term. The other thing is people will associate mead with being a very sweet drink, like I'm drinking a glass of honey. Mm -hmm. But mead can be made of all different sweetnesses like wines. Uh, you can ferment it to dryness, have like a dry Chardonnay type. Uh, you can have a sweet dessert wine. So again, it depends on how you, what yeast you use, how much sugar you start out with. And then you can age it. There was a beekeeper in Buckfast Abbey in England known as Brother Adam, and he took over the uh, apiary at Buckfast Abbey in about 1919, and he became their mead maker for all the, the brothers there. And uh, there's one uh, writer on uh, popular books on fermenting and beer making and stuff who actually visited over there with another mead maker and had some like 40-year-old mead that he said was outstanding. Hmm. But uh, Brother Adam would generally age his about seven years in oak. Yeah, oh, wow. So again, the, the fermented beverage. And then there's all different names depending on what you can do it with. I think a couple of years ago there was a big thing about uh, Obama making uh, beer in the White House, and they had a White House honey porter. Well, in the land of mead, that would be called bucket or bracket because it has barley and honey in it. So again, but if you call it honey porter, then it doesn't sound as offensive as bucket or bracket. So again, it's all, uh, you know, terminology there. So you make mead yourself? Yes. And do you use your honey from your bees to make that mead? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, the stuff we used to get in Arizona, the uh, mesquite, cat's claw, and saguaro was just water white, and it made a super fine white mead mm -hmm. or light mead. Uh, another one I like is mixing, there used to be a beverage available called uh, Five Alive. It was a mixture of citrus drinks. It was like you drank it for orange juice. I would use that with honey, and that made a super beverage. And I had some that's still around that's about six years old that's really fine drinking right now. But, uh, but again, you can make it. It's like anything like that. You can make it to your taste. Right. And Does it make a difference, the type of honey? Because, you know, you've got... That's another question you get, you know, um, why is this darker and why is this lighter? Well, a lot of it depends on what they were foraging on. That's true, so. and how hot it was stored at, because mm -hmm. it'll discolor with excessive heat. Uh, again, if you have a bad-tasting mead or a bad-tasting honey, making mead out of it is not going to improve the flavor. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's still going to be bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... so we're going to just keep on swarming on our conversation here. We're going to keep buzzing. Because um, so I'm um, thinking about honey and mead. And uh, so we buy that, right? And you're talking about bottling it and selling it and um, that kind of thing. Um, but there's a lot of economic impact associated with bees and beekeeping and honey and all of the associated things. Let's talk about that just a little bit. It has a great impact on agriculture. I mean, a, a lot of... Um, good agriculture production comes from pollination and those bees are a great contributor not just honeybees mm -hmm. i mean there's what solitary what's... bees your bumblebees any of your pollinators mm -hmm. in fact even your wasp are pollinators insects are pollinators if you look take a book on entomology or identification of insects and it can be about that thick, and you look at about 60% of them, the adult feed is nectar or pollen, mm -hmm. nectar and pollen, because that's their protein and their energy sources. That uh, you're, Even your little tiny, tiny parasitic wasp, they feed on nectar. And things like uh, yarrow, uh, cilantro, any of those real tiny flowers, aster, they can get in there and feed on it. They don't have very large flight range, but again, that's their adult uh, energy source. When we talk about agricultural production, we're talking about the food we eat and mm. the food our livestock eats. And there's just so much overlap to, you know, what the consumer needs, what animals need, our livestock needs that come from pollination. If we didn't have pollination, we would have a big problem. Well, it's something like $17 billion dollars of agricultural crops are directly related to the influence of bees by pollination. If you like almonds, they're 100% pollinated with mm -hmm. bees. 
and there's great migratory beekeeping where they go out in uh, January, February time frame and they pollinate. There's X number of hives per, per uh, acre of almonds. There's two types of almonds. There's a soft shell and a hard shell. One blooms first and the next one follows on. So they bring the bees in there. And for like a three week period, a beekeeper can be paid almost $200 a hive for pollination services. And when you look at it, there are millions of hives going there. I calculated it one day, and if you put a uh, 90 hives on each 18-wheeler, you'd have a line of 18-wheelers about 80 miles long. Wow. That's how many millions of hives that go out there. And to put a dollar figure to that is yeah. pretty astronomical. It's yeah. <laughs> yes. Higher than I can count. Yeah. <laughs> more figures yeah, than more I have. <laughs> Uh, but the other problem with migratory beekeeping, which pollinating almonds is a good example, is bees need a variety of nutrition. So if I have them on monoculture, one culture only, I may influence their development in that they don't have a balanced diet. In other words, they don't have all the amino acids or minerals they need. So that's one of the problems with uh, putting things on a monoculture. It's better if they have a wide variety of pollens that will balance out their diet. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, what is something that you wish that people knew about bees, or what's like some of? Is there common misunderstandings that you would like to correct? Or the common thing that I there, see is fear. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people are scared of bees in general, and um, if you have an, an an allergic reaction, you know you do. Then yes, you should be mindful and definitely steer clear. But some people are just afraid of the thought of bees and what i find with mine is uh, i'll speak this is personal is that the more i'm around our bees the more the or the less that they mess with me i've got bees that you can weed eat around and they won't do anything now when it comes to extracting their honey that's a different deal they'll become defensive and whatnot i have one hive though that's they're very aggressive they always let you know they're there Somebody always comes out and taps you on the shoulder and mm -hmm. says, hey, mm -hmm. just keep in mind that we're here. Is that the one that kicked out their queen and had to get a new one? No, it was a different, <laughs> one. It was a different one. No, that's the one he needs to kick the queen out <laughs> yeah. and get a new one. <laughs> yeah, those genetics are aggressive. So, But bees really are pretty peaceful. I mean, I can go out in our gardens at the extension mm -hmm. office and be right up close to them, and they're foraging on the flowers that we've got out there, and they won't mess with me. Mm. Um, but some people can't get, I mean, they see them 10 feet away and they take off. Yeah. So The thing I would uh, advise people is if you think you're allergic to bees, go to an allergist and get tested. It's a blood test. And you can uh, find out how sensitive you are. I went in a couple of years ago. I had an adverse reaction to a bee sting and went in and got tested. And I found out I was allergic to bald face hornets and vespids, which are the common wasp around here although I've never had a bad reaction from them. So mm -hmm. I've been on uh, desensitization shots for a couple of years now, and I can get five or six stings and have absolutely no adverse reaction. Wow. But if you're allergic to them, it can be very fatal. My little dog got a couple bee stings. I heard a yelp. Another yelp went and got her, took the bees off, put her in my truck, shut the barn door, drive, drove her into the vet, and she was dead from the first mm -hmm. yelp to once she was dead was less than 15 minutes, anaphylactic shock. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, it's like peanut allergies and other things. If you think you're allergic to something, uh, be proactive and get it. Uh, uh, you know, EpiPens, uh, they come in all different prices, but, uh, you know, depending on your insurance. But again, think of, do I want to save my life or not? And an EpiPen, when you get a sting and it swells up, usually Benadryl will take care of it. It's when your throat starts closing and you're having, that's when you need that EpiPen. Mm -hmm. It's for more uh, uh, respiratory distress. So again, you know, if you get that in an EpiPen, get with your doctor and say, okay, when do I use this? Mm -hmm. Read the instructions on how to use it. But don't live your life in a bubble. A lot of times we, like at our place, we just keep them around, you know? I. Based on what I know, I don't have an allergy. I don't think anybody at our house has an allergy. But it, should we develop an allergy yep. or have a reaction, reaction. For, for whatever, we've got those pins. And our doctor, we just told him, we're beekeepers. And he said, ah, we're going to 
at least have you some yeah. in the cabinet. So. And so basically, well, unless you're allergic to them, um, then there's really not a lot to be afraid of about bees. But if you are allergic to them, there are ways that you can um, yes. Yes. address that. But and we, we didn't we didn't hit on it very hard. But bees are really important to our whole environment and yes. the, our ecosystem. So we we need bees. And besides that, we need honey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we talk about honey a lot, but beeswax is used in cosmetics. Uh, all your little pills that have that glossy coat, mm-hmm. they're tumbled with wax. Uh, you have propolis, which is plant resins that are gathered. That is used a lot in salves. It has some uh, antimicrobial benefits, antiviral benefits. You have royal jelly, you have pollen, you have all sorts of different products. There was a guy in Connecticut, Moratz, that would harvest the venom from the bees, have them walk across the mat, uh, like with uh, filter paper on it, electrical shock, they would sting the filter paper, you'd dehydrate and extract the venom, and that's what's used for the venom shots when you desensitize. So there's, like I say, there's lots and lots of different bee products out there Mm -hmm. that find their way into the economy. There are people with arthritis and a guy that was out building a building on our place, he said, oh, you have bees. He said, my mom has bad arthritis in her hands and she goes to a specialist that actually treats her with bee stings and it helps to some Mm -hmm. degree. So. Anyway, so, I found that very interesting. Yeah, so. So t- there are lo- lots of interesting things about bees, and so we didn't even really have time to get into some of the other things, like well, how well, to make sure that they stay. Well, one thing I would suggest is if you're around a bee and one's buzzing you, just walk calmly away. If you start flailing your Don't arms, uh, <laughs> you're going to bring more into the equation. But yeah. if you just gently walk out. I tell beekeepers when they're suited up and they're working a hive that there's a lot of bees around them and it's getting uncomfortable, walk out through the brush. Get through a, like a narrow hedge or something, and that will generally take the bees off of you. Uh, you know, that's being in a suit and stuff. So, And the other thing is fragrances. Uh, mm-hmm. You, you know, you can have different uh, fragrances. Uh, maybe you ate something and it's coming out through your pores. B.O. is supposed to be not, bees don't like B.O. Uh, so <laughs> Don't again, take a shower, protect yourself. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of yeah. things you can do to, uh, you know, protect yourself when you're around bees that don't be a magnet. You know, a lot of floral mm-hmm. scents will bring them in. Uh, bananas, no because mm-hmm. the banana oil is a sting attractant as part of their sting defense mechanism. So if you have ban- banana oil, and in the 70s they had a lot of movies, killer bees and stuff before your time, I know. But, uh, you know, they'd show all these stings on these little pieces. Well, you'd just put a little uh, banana oil on there, and they'd go bonkers because that was their sting alarm pheromone. So you could get hundreds of bee stings in a small area by just using some banana oil. Hmm. So again, there's things like that that will bring them in. Uh, that you know, if you're just savvy about it, mm-hmm. uh, the thing I would suggest is if people are interested in bees, is to get with a beekeeper, get suited up, see a hive. Uh, if we had the county fairs going in Houston Livestock and Rodeo and the Montgomery County Fair, usually there is an exhibit with a observation hive and beekeepers there that will answer your question. So you can walk up to a glass-sided hive, see the little bees there, maybe mm-hmm. see the queen, and be able to ask questions and just see them. Yeah. And you can always call the Extension Office. So our number is 936-539-7825. There's a couple of other numbers, but that's the one I always remember. Um, we have a website. You can uh, look at. Um, The Montgomery County Master Gardener Association also has a website, and then they also answer the phone, answer questions, and that kind of thing. So, you know, if you don't know, ask. And like you guys mentioned when we first started talking, um, you know, you may get a little different answers from different people that you ask, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those answers are wrong. It just means that there's a lot of factors to consider. It's all based on experience, too. so. So thank you so much for being with us and buzzing about bees. Bill and Brandon. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm having fun saying that. Um, so this, again, this is Extension Hour. Um, I will be on YouTube. We'll be on the uh, station's website and also on Facebook Live. And then um, we're, we're here on Fridays, 1 to 2 p.m. We cover a lot of different things about Extension. So this time we're talking about bees. Next time we're going to have um, Jo Picken. She's our 4-H program assistant. And she's going to talk a, a little bit about the hatching in the classroom program. So we'll talk about chickens next. And then, you know, after that, we may talk about something totally different because you never know because we do lots and lots of different things in Extension. But we we really appreciate our, our master gardeners and our experts that are there to help us. So thank you so much for being with us today, Bill. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, we'll be back next week. This is the Extension Hour on Lone Star Radio. Today's show was recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and all rights and ownership are reserved to Lone Star Community Radio. For more information regarding this program and Lone Star Community Radio, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's community radio station, serving the community with local programming on TV, radio, and online. If you enjoyed today's program, please support us by sponsorship or starting your own show. Contact us today by phone or text at 936-666-1084 or email the station at lscrstudios at gmail.com.